Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank Ash for the invite and selecting um, our work as the um, um, one of the late breaking you know, abstracts that will be presented tomorrow. Um, and on behalf of all the co-chairs, the centers, the patients and families, um, I'm glad to present the data. Uh, this is on reduced intensity conditioning for haploidentical bone marrow transplant in patients with symptomatic sickle cell disease. Um, the transplant was broken up into two arms. We have the adult and the pediatric strata. Um, so for adults with sickle cell disease, they continue to have a shortened lifespan. The median survival for a patient with severe sickle cell disease is still 48 years, and nothing has changed in the last 25 years. So if you look at the Kaplan-Meier curve below, looking at the cumulative survival on your y-axis, and on the x-axis, the age uh, at end of follow-up or death, you can see that the slope just keeps dropping after childhood. It's now clear to all of us that the heart, the lung, and the kidney complications account for over 50% of identifiable causes of death in sickle cell disease. Those who have cardiova um, cardiovascular disease causes about 26% of deaths. Those with elevated tricuspid recogitant jet velocity consistently predict early mortality. That's about 10 times the increased mortality risk. Those with FEV1% predicted of less than 70% by uh, pulmonary function test, present in 11% of children and 32% of adults. For every 1% decrease in FEV1%, there's a 2% increased risk of death. The estimated glomerular filtration, which assesses your kidney function, is less than 90 cc observed in 19% of adults. Reduced glomerular filtration rate in sickle cell disease is associated with a threefold greater risk of death. So this is what prompted, is there any way you can tra change this trajectory? We've known for many years that the myeloablative max sibling donor transplant has excellent outcomes in children. The question is, it's been deemed too toxic in adults because of the mounting chronic organ dysfunction. Um, after the seminal publication by the Hopkins group, looking at the haploidentical platform, which the result was good, um, with zero mortality. This is what prompted the quest to extend this to adults who had a higher mortality and had higher disease burden. Um, on this trial, uh, my protocol co-chairs, Michael Dubon, uh, Mark Walters from Benoit Children's Hospital in Oakland, and Robert Broski from Johns Hopkins University. This is a study that was sponsored by the NIH, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and the NCI. If you look at, just to anticipate, you know, it's kind of a very exciting time to be managing sickle cell disease. Uh, just as the plane landed in San Diego uh, last week, we got the approval from the FDA for the new gene therapy products. And anticipating that now we have um, a collection of curative agents, this is the time we now to decide, you know, what to pick. So. I kind of tried to, within what is available within public domain, to look at the three strategies in order to manage patients with severe sickle cell disease. Um, it was clear to me, and we can just go through the variables, that participants who received non myeloablative haplo bone marrow transplant had more overlapping comorbidities in our study compared to those who received gene therapy, whether it's the lentiglobin or the gene editing strategy based on what is published now. Um, so I kind of highlighted those with the haplo BMT. So if you look at uh, the three curative therapies now, um, ours was a phase two study. The lentiglobin was phase one to two. The CRISPR uh, as a phase three study. In haplo bone marrow transplant, you have more than 90% donor availability. Your siblings can be donor. Your parents can be donors. Your, your cousins can be donors. First and second, third degree relatives can be donors. So there's really endless donors within the family. And if you look at the lentic globin, despite the fact that you're using your own cells, uh, if you look at that published in blood, only 43 out of 51 people 
after evaluation could actually proceed to that therapy. We, I don't have the information on CRISPR yet. Our conditioning was non-myeloablative. That's huge. Because in adults who have organ dysfunction, you cannot give them myeloablative chemotherapy. The toxicity will be too high. This strategy by, uh, that we just did is non-myeloablative. Both gene therapies use myeloablative chemotherapy. Um, all studies were multicenter trials. Um, if you can look at the studies, I was actually, uh, the median ages look about the same. Um, if you also look at what's the lag time if you need a transplant or gene therapy, right? If you, if you come in and say you need gene therapy and you show up at the door and you bring your brother with you or your sister, we can get it done in a month. But there's also the uh, technical expertise for both lenticlobin and CRISPR gene editing that makes these therapies unavailable for up to a year, even if you've been uh, screened. Um, the, uh, looking at all the studies, um, for haplo-BMT, there were 42 patients that were evaluated for study endpoints, 35 in lentiglobin and 20 for CRISPR. Uh, Follow-up was pretty close. Uh, study endpoints for transplant, like we always look for, was graft failure and death. Because when you're going into this, we're taking very high-risk patients. If you look at the gene therapies, the endpoints for lentiglobin was pain episodes. And for CRISPR was pain episode and hospitalization. All of them enrolled severe patients. Just to give you a little preview of our outcomes, our event-free survival was 88% at two years post-transplant for the haplo bone marrow transplant. This is in very sick patients. Our overall survival to date, after two years, is 95%. So I'll kind of leave you with this slide. So, Haplobrack transplant, if you look at the overall comparison, is as effective as gene therapy and gene editing in improving donor engraftment. What do I mean by that? If you look at the median time to neutrophil engraftment, even though you're using other donor cells, it's about the same period. If you look at platelet engraftment, same period. Now, if you look at in sickle cell disease, this is a disease where they have chronic anemia. And that's the harbinger for a lot of the uh, morbidity in the transplant. If you look, at, I mean, in the disease, if you look at what's the um, hemoglobin at study endpoint, most patients, when they get new stem cells, they're hitting about 13.5 to 14 grams. If you look at patients with lentiglobin and CRISPR, they're around 11 grams. And it's only with late effects that we'll know whether that remains, it goes up or it goes down, because the follow up there is still shot. But what actually is important to me is the cost of the three procedures. So uh, because you have to realize one thing, 5% of patients with sickle cell disease are born in high income countries, 5%. 95% of uh, patients with sickle cell disease are born in low to middle income countries. The, the sticker price for haplo-BMT in the United States is 200 to $400,000. The FDA approved lentiglobin gene therapy for 3.1 million and CRISPR for 2.2 million. The question is, how can you scale this? If they look pretty similar in what they do, even though we have more late effects, follow up with transplant, which one is scalable to allow you to reach 95% of the population of those who need it? So in conclusion, reduced intensity haplo bone marrow transplant in adults with sickle cell disease shows durable donor engraftment at two years with low mortality. Our two year event free survival was 88% with an overall survival of 95% and are comparable to that reported after matched sibling donors in children with myeloablative bone marrow transplant. This resource supports haploidentical bone marrow transplant with post-transplant cytoxan as a suitable and tolerable curative therapy for adults with sickle cell disease and severe end organ toxicity, such as stroke, pulmonary hypertension, a population typically excluded from participating in myeloablative gene therapy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kasim. And finally, Dr. Aldo.